complications. But what I think a lot of people forget about and what I want to talk about today is the risk with depression and anxiety. There is also a significant association with eating disorders in women with PCOS that I just wanted to bring up, even though I'm not going to sort of focus on today. I initially got interested in this a couple of years ago. So the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society was working on updating international guidelines on the treatment diagnosis of PCOS, and they asked me to do um, a systematic review and meta-analysis on the associations between depression and anxiety and PCOS. So my objectives today are to first just highlight some of these new international guidelines and then to really focus on the meat of what I want to talk about, which is this association between PCOS and depression and anxiety, potential causes for this association, and then treatment options for depression in women with PCOS. And no disclosures. Um, and is this okay? It sounds funny to me. We're good? Okay. So as most people know, PCOS is one of the most common endocrine disorders in reproductive age women. And these new guidelines are really fantastic. I can send them out after um, you know, the talk today. There's both this sort of like big, large manual that's like 200 pages that I haven't even read, so I don't expect people to read, but like control find works really well, so it's super helpful <laughs> if you're looking for something in particular because they really have looked at everything. And then there's a nine page sort of algorithms kind of distilled down bullet points you know, how do we diagnose PCOS? How do you treat infertility related with PCOS? What about non-infertility things? What should you screen for? So that's something that you can kind of have, you know, to look at on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want to talk about some changes in these guidelines that actually have to do with how PCOS is diagnosed. So everybody knows the Rotterdam criteria for PCOS. So, you know, irregular periods, the clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, and then the ovarian morphology. And you have to have two out of the three of these to diagnose PCOS. And so this hasn't changed. These three overarching categories are the same. But some of the actual nuances that to change who we're diagnosing with PCOS has changed. Um, and you know, I should, before I say this, I should say that these international guidelines were um, sponsored in part by ASRM, but they were actually um, endorsed by over 30 international societies. So these are sort of the big deal. This is what we're doing in the future. So what's really changed about the number of antral follicles is it used to be 12, and it has now gone up to 20 antral follicles. And I think this is fantastic, because we were seeing a lot of young, healthy women who had 16 antral follicles, and you just didn't feel like they had PCOS, but they were meeting the at least the ultrasound criteria, and our ultrasounds have just gotten better. So this really raises the bar, so someone has to have, you know, more than 20 antral follicles in order to be meet this ultrasound criteria. The ovarian volume criteria is the same, so more than 10 centimeters cubed, and obviously you can't have any kind of follicle or cyst more than a centimeter. The second criteria is that clinical biochemical hyperandrogenism. And I think a lot of people, sort of someone comes in, they're complaining of hair growth and they immediately think of PCOS, but they don't always know how to kind of score it or categorize it. So what's recommended is this Fairman Galway score, and I also have one that I give to all patients that I can send out. So there's nine different body parts, and you're just having patients rate their hair growth between zero and four. And I always tell them that the like, um, you know, thin, what is it, peach fuzz type hair doesn't count, and you're really looking for that dark, coarse hair. So clinical hyperandrogenism is defined as more than eight on this score. And that used to be what we were using for PCOS, and this has actually gone down. So for Caucasians and African Americans, it's more than or equal to four, and for Chinese, it's more than or equal to six. So with these kind of changes, we're like increasing the number of follicles that we need, but decreasing sort of the severity of hirsutism. No changes in acne or alopecia, so these are both recognized as clinical hyperandrogenism, they're super hard to score. So like someone who has acne, there are ways to score it, but none of it has been validated in PCOS. 
So unless someone has really, really severe cystic acne or really bad alopecia, I'm not usually taking that alone. I'm obviously looking for other signs. No changes in the biochemical hyperandrogenism, so just I personally check free and total testosterone on everyone. I tend towards checking DHEDS. I don't check androstenedione unless someone doesn't meet um, the criteria, but I have a really high suspicion. But if any of these were elevated, it would go along with PCOS. And then no change in the irregular period category, but they've just done a really good job at kind of laying it out. So they have guidelines for if it's been less than a year since monarchy. What about one to three years? What about more than three years? They've decreased uh, this a little bit, so it used to be nine and now it's eight. Um, but I find that a lot of people are meeting criteria by some of the other um, classifications anyway. And then obviously most people know that some women can have regular cycles and still not actually be ovulating. So if you think that's a concern, you can check testosterone levels. So those are sort of the main changes. I think the biggest one is the number of follicles, um, the changes in the clinical hyperandrogenism, and you know a little bit of tweaking here and there. And then everybody knows to rule out um, other causes of irregular periods. <laughs> So TSH, prolactin, um, the residents know I'm a big proponent of checking estradiol with FSH. So I just had someone the other day who a regular period had an FSH that was, you know, an E2 that were checked before they came to me, FSH of 8, E2 of 300. And so it just happened that this woman who never gets periods, like once or twice a year, was ovulating right at the time that these labs were checked, ended up with like an incidental ultrasound a week later that showed a corpus luteum. But when she came to me, I had to tell her, like, I can't really interpret that FSH because it was the one time you were ovulating. So it's possible that if we had checked at baseline, it would be high or low. So just keep those in mind as you're kind of interpreting these levels. Everyone checks, knows to check a 17 OHP. I very, very rarely rule out Cushing's. I've had some women who, you know, were diagnosed with high blood pressure at 15 or some, like, other kind of outlier and so sometimes in those situations I'll check it. So that was just my fun like update about new guidelines because I get to be up here and like tell everybody things. Um, but what I really want to talk about is depression and anxiety. So we'll sort of switch gears. Um, mood disorders are incredibly common so about 20 percent of um, people in the general population will have depression, five to eight percent will have anxiety. And they're associated with other psychiatric comorbidities, impairment in other areas of life, and increased risks of coronary heart disease. In women particularly, they're associated with an earlier age of onset and poor social adjustment and quality of life. There are multiple different ways to diagnose them. So there's screening questions, um, notably the Beck Depression Inventory, Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. They ask patients questions on like a Likert scale about senses of hopelessness, sleep, you know, mood, activity, and it correlates really well with actual DSM diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So what I did sort of as part of these guidelines was a systematic review and meta-analysis. We had over 30 cross-sectional studies in 10 different countries, and this included 3,000 women with PCOS and 3,800 controls. So this is the results of our meta-analysis, and just to kind of orient people, this forest plot here is the odds ratio of one, so anything on this side is showing that there's an increased risk of depression in women with PCOS. And we basically found that women with PCOS had over 3.8 times the odds of depression and controls. We also looked into depression severity. So that's one of the downsides of using these kind of depression scales is because sometimes someone might have mild depressive symptoms but not actually have um, you know, clinically significant depression or anxiety. So we looked just at the moderate and severe depression categories and still found that women with PCOS had over four times the odds of clinically significant depression. We found the same thing with anxiety. So over five times the odds of anxiety than controls and six times the odds of clinically significant anxiety. 
because these were cross-sectional studies, there's a lot of concern about you know, potential confounders being the, behind this relationship. The things that I was most concerned about is where patients were being recruited. So you can imagine if all PCOS women were recruited from the infertility clinics and then you know, the controls were recruited from the co community, that could like easily explain the association. So we did a bunch of sensitivity analyses and basically found that none of these associations could be explained in differences in demographic characteristics. Again, these were cross-sectional studies, and so we don't always know the direction of the association, but there have been multiple longitudinal studies, again, demonstrating that women with PCOS at baseline who don't have depression or anxiety have increased risks of developing it long-term. So then the question sort of is, why are women with PCOS more likely to be depressed? And it kind of goes back to the very beginning when we were talking about how there's so much here and just so many potential sort of associations with PCOS. So maybe it's, you know, the hair growth and the body image. Maybe it's the obesity by itself or sort of different infertility. And I'll kind of go through some of those different sort of aspects. Just as like a little statistics kind of heads up, I wanted to talk about um, some of the analyses that I'm going to be presenting. So as part of our meta-analysis, we also did a meta-regression. And so the difference is with the meta-analysis, we're comparing women with PCOS to controls. In the meta-regression, this is all women with PCOS, and we're looking at those with or without depression um, and with or without anxiety. And then we were comparing the mean values. So you can imagine that if all women with PCOS who had depression had much higher BMIs than women without um, depression, that could sort of potentially explain it. So I'll kind of go through some of these things, you know, BMI, testosterone, hirsutism, and we'll sort of talk about it. The results we get from the meta-regression is the standardized mean difference, which is sort of an effect size, and so it kind of ranges from small, medium to large. So we'll start with obesity. Um, you know, obesity is obviously one of the first things that people think about. Somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of women with PCOS are overweight or obese. There have been studies looking in the general population. So this is a meta-analysis of longitudinal studies showing that in um, women who have obesity at baseline without depression, they have over 50 percent higher odds of developing depression in the long term. When we did our meta-regression, we found that women with PCOS who had depression had higher mean BMI, so they were more overweight obese than women who didn't have depression. We found the same thing with anxiety. And if you sort of remember the standardized mean difference, these are sort of like small differences. So what to me this is showing is that we know in the general population that obesity um, is associated with depression. And we're seeing the same thing in women with PCOS. So in women with PCOS, obesity is also associated with depression. So maybe it's the answer. And then we're done. And we can get to go, like, go have lunch early. Um, but that's not what we found in our meta-analysis. So again, this is a little bit complicated, but the concern is when you're doing these cross-sectional studies, if you're recruiting women with PCOS and controls, and you know that women with PCOS are more likely to be overweight, it's possible that some of this association just can be explained by mismatches in BMI. And so if that's not controlled for, it can be a major confounder. So the way we looked at this was pulling out studies that matched on BMI and studies that didn't match on BMI. And if it was only sort of a BMI problem, you would expect these studies to have an odds ratio near one and these to have a higher odds ratio. And what we found is that in both groups, women with PCOS were over three times more likely to have depression um, and no significant differences between them. We found the same thing when we looked at anxiety. So in studies that matched on um, BMI, we found six times uh, the odds of having uh, anxiety. 
So the way I interpret this is that obesity can explain why some women with PCOS have depression the same way some women who don't have PCOS are obese and are more likely to have uh, depression. But it doesn't explain why more women with PCOS have depression because we're still, even when controlling for BMI, still finding these increased odds. What about insulin resistance? So your women with PCOS are more likely to have insulin resistance, and this is even seen in lean women with PCOS compared to BMI-matched controls. And this is sort of on the spectrum of impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes. So when you look at this in the general population, it gets complicated. We already talked about studies looking at obesity and depression. There have also been longitudinal meta-analyses looking at diabetes and insulin resistance and also showing increased risks of depression long term. The largest study to look at this in women with PCOS was done at UCSF. Just over 300 women with PCOS, it was cross-sectional, and they measured HOMA IR, which is like a marker of insulin resistance, and did the Beck depression inventory. And this graph is also a little bit complicated, so before I show you the results, we have on the y-axis the HOMA IR, so increasing amounts of insulin resistance. BMI categories, normal, overweight, and obese, and then each of those are divided into negative and positive depression screens. So if we take depression out of it, you can all sort of imagine that as weight goes up, insulin resistance is going to go up. So we sort of expect to see you know, the numbers going up here. But really what we're looking at is within each category, what is the role of depression? So if depression doesn't play a role, then there's, these two bars are going to be the same. If it does, uh, or if insulin resistance plays a role in depression, then you're going to see sort of higher values in those with positive depression. So this is what we see. So what you would expect uh, as BMI goes up, insulin resistance goes up, in the normal weight categories, insulin resistance has no effect on depression. But as you go into the overweight and obese categories, you have higher uh, rates of um, mean values of HOMA IR, and those are the positive depression screen. And what they actually found is that for each one unit increase in HOMA IR, there was a 6% increased odds of having a positive depression screen. And this was even after controlling for confounders like BMI. When we did our meta-regression, we found that women with PCOS and depression also had higher mean HOMA IR values, but there was no difference in anxiety. So to me, all of this sort of comes together that potentially insulin resistance plays a role. We're still seeing small effect size, so it's probably not the whole thing, but it's something to be sort of thinking about. Next criteria is elevated androgens. Um, so there have been some studies in the general population, notably the study of women's health across the nation, the Penn Ovarian Aging Study, which looked at women in the perimenopause transition. And they found that increased baseline testosterone and increased changes in testosterone over time were associated with higher depression scores. There's also functional MRI studies that show a relationship between testosterone and amygdala activity, which is a region implicated in depression. So in terms of women with PCOS, when we looked at this uh, in our meta-regression, we found higher mean levels of free testosterone in women with PCOS and anxiety, but there was no association with total testosterone and no association with free or total testosterone and depression. So probably not sort of the, the answer to everything. Hirsutism is another sort of interesting um, concern, again, talking about sort of body image, which is definitely decreased in women with PCOS. So this was a study in the general population looking at Farrah McGalway scores more than 15 compared to lower scores, and there were higher mean depression and anxiety scores in those with higher Farrah McGalway scores. When we looked at this in our study, we found that mean Farrah McGalway scores were increased in women with depressive and anxiety symptoms, and both of these were significant. And in fact, women who had clinical hirsutism 
had over 50% increased odds of having depression compared to women without hirsutism. Now we're sort of getting into like less common things that people sort of realize are associated with PCOS. And so one of them is this hyperactive HPA access and something that I think is one of the most intriguing sort of factors. So everybody knows this, but just to sort of graphically think about it, normal HPA axis, hypothalamus releasing CRH, anterior pituitary releasing ACTH, adrenal cortex releasing cortisol. And then you have this negative feedback loop where as cortisol goes up, inhibiting release of hormones from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. So this is one of the um, main hypotheses behind you know, depression is this abnormal hyperactive HPA access. So what you see in depression is that you end up, have, end up having problems with this negative feedback loop. So you get increased CRH, hypertrophy of the anterior pituitary and adrenal cortex, and increased cortisol production. So been very clearly demonstrated that in individuals with depression, there's this hyperactive HPA access. There's been only a couple studies looking at this in women with PCOS, but they've both shown increased in cortisol, as well as heart rate and ACTH after a stressor compared to controls. So cortisol is also implicated in accumulation of central fat, insulin resistance. I think it's pretty intriguing. You know, could potentially this altered stress reactivity in PCOS patients be the link, not just to de depression, but to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular risks. But we don't know. <laughs> so there haven't been any studies who have really looked at this link between abnormalities and HPA access and depression anxiety in women with PCOS. So a big gray box we can talk about to it in the future. Um, fertility, again, a lot of women have difficulty getting pregnant, could potentially it just be a matter of infertility. So when we looked at this in our um, systematic review, there were four studies that matched on fertility status, either all fertile patients or all infertile patients, and found that in three of those four studies, there were still high risks of depression and anxiety. So likely not the whole picture. When you look at the actual um, sort of just numbers of risks of depression in women with PCOS, uh, and fertility, uh, compared to women's fertility in general, it's higher in fertility compared to the general population, but not nearly as high as what we're seeing in these women with PCOS. Inflammation, I'm sorry, Alex, I have like one slide on this. Um, so this is another sort of intriguing possibility for the future. So when we think about the pathogenesis of PCOS, there's questions about how much inflammation is involved. And so there are higher levels of C-reactive protein in women with PCOS compared to controls, but there have not been any links looking at specifically at depression or anxiety and inflammation. So Dr. Stanek and I just got a grant looking at markers of inflammation in women with PCOS and controls with infertility in particular who are undergoing IVF. We're going to check um, blood at the beginning, check their follicular fluid at the time of their egg retrieval, compare their sort of immunome profile. And our goal with this is looking at just comparing them, predicting um, outcomes, live birth, but all of these women will also have depression and anxiety scores, so my hope is to sort of use this to also see if there's a link between depression and anxiety and any uh, inflammatory markers. We'll see. Um, so what you can kind of see from all of this is that it's really complex. There's a lot of potential associations. Nothing that I've sort of said seems to be magic. They're all potentially playing a small role or maybe the studies are flawed, they're small studies, maybe none of these are playing a role. But what we do know is that they are all very interconnected. So it's hard sometimes to kind of tease out what is really the effects of you know, one thing versus what's multiple different problems coming together. So when we think about treating depression in women with PCOS, a lot of it goes back to you know, how do we treat PCOS.
And, and this is hard. I just had someone the other day who came to me like, well, once we start to, once we're done treating my PCOS, then I can talk about fertility. And I'm like, there's no magic treatment. You know, I can treat some of your different symptoms. I can help with the hair growth. I can help with the irregular periods. But there's not, there's not like a magic pill that like every other doctor has been holding out on you that like I have. But that's just not unfortunately true. So the general sort of PCOS treatment, we talk about behavioral, you know, modification, lifestyle changes, physical exercise, insulin sensitizers, particularly metformin, birth control pills, hair removal for hirsutism, um, and psychological interventions, you know, counseling with a therapist. And when we look at where these interplay with a lot of these potential etiologies, again, it's complex. And as we, we go through them, there's one additional one that we don't think about for treating PCOS in general, but pioglitazone, there's been a study looking at for the treatment of depression. So we'll talk about that. And you know, if we're trying to design the perfect study, looking at treating depression in women with PCOS, you would start with, it sounds like straightforward, you know, a cohort of women with PCOS who also have depression. You would randomize them to different treatments, and then your primary outcome would be, you know, improvement in depression. Unfortunately, what we have is these overall studies that include women with PCOS. Some have depression, some don't. They're randomized, but the primary outcomes are, you know, fertility or weight loss or improvement in testosterone. And then we're looking at these secondary outcomes, which, if we're lucky, are depression or anxiety, but a lot of times are just quality of life. So. Again, this, uh, there aren't a lot of great studies sort of looking at treating depression in women with PCOS. We'll go through some of them. So lifestyle modifications, there has been at least five comparing different types of exercise, diet, alternative medication like yoga or acupuncture. And what they found is that all arms have improvement in quality of life. So it's working, but we don't necessarily know what it is that's working or if it's just that sort of regression to the mean where people are kind of getting better over time. The only one that showed an improvement was this high protein, low carb diet actually did improve depression scores themselves. Now, I'm generally very hesitant to sort of push patients on a specific type of diet. You know, I want someone to be, I don't want them to be too restrictive. I want it to be something that they can maintain long term. But I will sometimes suggest, you know, if they're thinking about changing their, their eating habits, that some of this high protein, where they're trying to get a protein with every meal, they're thinking about snacks like nuts that are high in protein. When they're thinking about carbs, they're thinking about the brown carbs, you know, whole grain, bread, rice, pasta. But again, it was just one study. Um, there's been a study comparing lifestyle versus birth control pills. So this was done at Penn and Penn State while I was there. And it was particularly looking at women who were overweight obese with PCOS who were attempting pregnancy. So not just this sort of depression population. But they were randomized to birth control pills, lifestyle modification, which also included weight loss medication, so a pretty intensive um, program, and then combined. And so this is what they found when they looked at depression. Um, so this is the percentage of women who meet uh, a threshold for diagnosis of depression. Uh, start of the study, end of the study, blue is lifestyle, red is birth control pills, and green is combined. And so you can see a statistically significant improvement in depression in those in the lifestyle and the birth control groups. And we see the same thing in anxiety. And of course, you're probably wondering, like I was, why, you know, the combined group, why is it not at least working a little bit? And so this is the problem with these studies. You know, these women, most of them didn't have depression or anxiety. So here, this represents one person in the combined group who had depression at the beginning, who didn't have depression at the end. So unfortunately, you can't really conclude much from this. It might help, you know, these birth control pills, but it's, there hasn't been anything that's really definitively uh, shown it. Treatment of insulin resistance. So you know, metformin is commonly used in women with PCOS who have impaired glucose tolerance, who have diabetes. There have been three trials comparing metformin versus placebo, with both groups having lifestyle um, modification. Everybody had improvement in quality of life, but there were no differences between metformin and placebo. 
But we can't necessarily conclude much from this because, again, we're not looking at this cohort of women with depression. We're just sort of looking at random quality of life in other studies. One of the most interesting studies that I'll talk about actually looks at pioglitazone. So another insulin sensitizer that looks, works differently than metformin. So it works through this PPAR gamma receptor. So there have been studies looking at this in the general population and then have shown improvement in depression in women treated with um, medications that work through this receptor. So there was a um, small but sort of good quality study looking at women with PCOS who had major depressive disorder. All of them had a BMI more than 27, and they were randomized to metformin or pioglitazone for six weeks. And this is pretty striking. So here you have the mean change in the Hamilton depression score. Zero is where they were starting from. No change in metformin. Pretty significant improvement in pioglitazone. And what they found is that no group had any improvement in insulin resistance. So the question is whether pioglitazone improves depression with this mechanism that's unrelated to insulin resistance. Maybe it's inflammation, maybe it's through these receptors. It's only 40 women. I haven't started like giving all of my, I haven't given any of my women, you know, with PCOS pioglitazone, but it's really intriguing to me. And so I think it's something that I sort of always keep in the back of my mind that would be worth repeating. Laser hair removal, this sort of makes sense. You know, again, hirsutism, body image. There have um, been studies, well, a study specifically in women with PCOS that showed if you do laser hair removal, it improves depression scores. So something to think about. And then those have all been PCOS specific treatments. So things that we think about treating for other reasons. You know, we're already giving them on birth control pills to regulate their periods. We're already talking about metformin if they have a pair of glucose tolerance. What about depression sort of in general? So the recommendation um, from the American College of Physicians is that first line should actually be cognitive behavioral therapy or the second generation antidepressants, the SSRIs. These unfortunately have not been studied in PCOS. So when I was first looking into this topic and I saw a Cochrane review, I was like, great, this is easy. Antidepressants for PCOS. There are no studies that look at antidepressants in women with PCOS. And this is important because a lot of these antidepressants have impacts on weight. And so if you're thinking about starting a medication on someone with PCOS who's already more likely to have issues with weight, it would be helpful to sort of know that it worked uh, the same way that it works in other populations. So it doesn't mean that it's not great, it just means we don't have data to support it. What about cognitive behavioral therapy? So CBT is basically taking the maladaptive you know, thoughts and emotions that someone has that sort of would lead to negative behaviors and kind of restructuring the way they're thinking about things. So we actually did a study looking at cognitive behavioral therapy in women with PCOS while I was at Penn, and we tried to design it. It was a pilot, so it was small, but we tried to design it the way you would want these studies to be designed. So they were all women who had PCOS and depression and who were overweight or obese. Women were randomized into two groups. Um, the CBT group received uh, eight weeks of 30-minute um, in-person cognitive behavioral therapy. And then the lifestyle group during those same times met with a team member as this like contact control because sometimes just talking about some of your um, thoughts and emotions can improve them. So they were queried about their symptoms, but no actual therapy was done. And then both groups received 16 visits with a nutritionist. They were given um, instructions on exercise goals that increased throughout the course of the study, as well as sort of calorie goals. So complicated uh, sort of setup, but this is what we did. So lifestyle for the whole time, the CBT versus contract for the first eight weeks. Each visit we did depression and anxiety and weight. Um, and then we also looked at quality of life, stress, um, labs. We did this Trier social stress test, which is pretty cool. So. Um, the subjects had to go in front of this sort of like fake panel and 
do this like arithmetic component and a like fake speech for a job interview. And then we measured <laughs> we measured cortisol and heart rate at different time points, you know, before and after the stressor. So pretty cool, we did a lot. So I'm just gonna talk about a little bit of it. Um, and our primary outcome was weight. So I'm just gonna throw that in here and we'll talk about weight too. So this is a line plot looking at uh, weekly weights for everybody. Um, change from baseline weights, so starting off at like zero. And if you divide it into the lifestyle loan group versus the CBT and lifestyle group, you can see a significant um, increase in weight loss in those who received CBT. And I did take the outlier out, like this fabulous person who lost a ton of weight, um, and the results are unchanged. We looked at quality of life and found improvements in quality of life in those who received CBT on the first eight weeks, but then this kind of uh, leveled off, so by the time we got to 16 weeks, there was no difference. We saw overall improvement in depress depressive and anxiety symptoms in the overall group, but there was no difference between the two groups. So I think that CBT is promising. Um, again, it's sort of what I, when I think about women with depression, the first thing I'm really thinking about is getting them hooked up with um, a health psychologist to start talking. There is really the only study looking at CBT in depression with women with PCOS. So when we start thinking about ways that we can improve it or repeat it, thinking about longer CBT, so we just did eight weeks, potentially sort of extending it out for longer so that some of these improvements that we see initially will continue out longer. It's hard for people to get in for weekly visits. So there have been good studies looking at, you know, computerized CBT, CBT over the phone, some other things that we can do to sort of make this more feasible for patients. So in conclusion, I hope that Sort of everyone agrees that PCOS is associated with depression and anxiety. It's definitely a problem, but I think that there's hope. So we know that a lot of the general treatments that we think about, you know, things like improving the hirsutism, lifestyle modification, talking to a therapist, a lot of that stuff really does help in these patients, even though there's not necessarily a magic bullet. So again, when you start thinking about PCOS and you're getting overwhelmed, one more thing, don't forget, you know, to screen patients for depression and anxiety. And then I just like to sort of tell people what I do so that you can sort of think about what you want to incorporate into your practice. So I screen all of my patients with depression and anxiety. Um, I do two depression screens, the patient health questionnaire and the back depression inventory. And then I do one anxiety, the generalized anxiety disorder. And then I screen for quality of life, eating disorder, stress, and sleep apnea so that I can send people to appropriate referrals. As people know, we're like trugging along with this multidisciplinary clinic. So right now, myself and Gretchen Diem are seeing patients together. The EPIC build is like, I swear, they're promising a lot, but should be by the end of October set up. We've already identified, oops, um, an endocrinologist who I'm super excited to be working with, Dr. Sood, and so soon it's going to be that patients come in and they see all three of us in one visit, which I think is gonna be great, because right now I'm sort of trying to do all of it. So if you have an endocrinologist who's talking to them about the impaired glucose tolerance, the lipids, the increased long-term risks, they're gonna sort of hear a lot more of that than if it's focused too much into one visit. We've met a lot with the nutritionists. They're still working on FTE coverage, so we don't have a nutritionist set up, but this would sort of be my end goal. And I've already mentioned um, the project that Dr. Stanek and I are doing together. I'm working with some medical students looking at postpartum depression, which surprisingly there's like nothing out there on that. When we get this um, clinic set up, my hope is to have this longitudinal cohort of women that we're sort of following where we can look at baseline risk factors and what's associated with long-term development of depression and anxiety. My like pie in the sky goal is to like confirm these pie glutazone results because I think they're so neat. Um, and then Gretchen and I have talked a lot about group therapy for PCOS. I think this would be really helpful. You know, women a lot of times fear, feel alone and isolated. So if they're talking to someone else who's sort of been through the same thing that they've been to, talking about what's worked for them for their hair growth or what side effects they've had, we think that would be really helpful.
Um, just like to acknowledge my main mentor at Penn and continued for the, the last year uh, in PCOS has been Dr. Lucia Dokrist. Uh, obviously with the RCT we did, we had um, significant help from psychiatry and um, the Center for Weight and Eating Disorders. And then as Katie said, I was supported by T32. Question. Thank you. I don't actually want Alex to ask me a question, so <laughs> just talk for the next few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. I was um, a really, really appreciative talk. Um, as a social scientist, I always think about structural underpinnings yeah. in mental health, right, as opposed to only individual biomarker yeah. um, conditions. And so I was curious if any of the studies in your meta analysis examined things like race and class, which we know are strongly yes. correlated with depression, and also um, along those lines, I'm thinking about gender and depression anxiety. So we know in our society, because of gender socialization, women yeah. are more likely to be depressed. And I, was, I can't imagine, but I was wondering if any of these studies exam used a scale of um, getting at sort of gender norms. Like, you know, I would imagine that patients who have stronger adherence to traditional gender norms may then be more threatened by yeah. hair loss or, or hair growth yeah. and other things. Remark on any yeah, fantastic question. So, race is hard for a lot of these studies. Um, most of them, as I said, were international, ten different countries. So, what we tried to use as a proxy for race was sort of um, continent of origin. So, looking at the U.S. versus England versus Asia versus India, um, and found that even when you stratified for, by all of those different countries, there was still significant increased risks of depression in all of those different groups. It wasn't large enough for us to find statistically significant differences between each of those groups, but it's hard because the ones in the U.S. will include, you know, Caucasian and African Americans, but you get the, the ones in Sweden where they're very homogeneous. Um, I don't think that there's been anything that's been done looking at, as you said, sort of adherence, like your sort of personal self, um, you know, someone who has hirsutism who is in these different sort of cultures. I don't know if that's really been done, but that's interesting. Thank you. I just had one comment and one question. So um, we're, we're so excited, Laurie, just the presentation was awesome. I think mean, the work you've done is great. Your food just so bright, very big, makes me very happy, very proud. So then I had a question about pietism. Because I don't know anything about it at all. Um, so one thought that I was wondering yeah. and is that with metformin, when you're comparing those two, does pioglitazone have a lot of side effects that metformin does? So the yeah, so the endocrinology. Oh, sorry, keep going. Because well, I just I was wondering, like, if there is some of a placebo effect of being able to take a pill that you don't have all these terrible yes. side effects of diarrhea and GI distress. That if you're taking something, it feels more positive yeah. to help kind of give that push. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I've never used it when I talked when I've talked to endocrinologists about it. They were sort of like, oh, we don't really like to use this because of side effects. Um, so I think that it has a lot of its own problems. Yeah, um, but that's interesting. I don't think I'm trying to think back to that study, and I'll have to look at whether or not they compared side effects in the two groups, because usually a lot of these randomized trials do, but I don't remember. Would that be interesting? Yeah. Will you share your slides? Yeah. Thank you. It's a big change. And the one thing I'll say is with the ultrasound, and I'm sure you guys are struggling with this too, like if I do an ultrasound in my clinic, I can count. If someone goes to radiology, the radiologists never count. And so if you even sometimes look at those cine clips and like, I don't know, residents have seen me do this, where you like click and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, click, one, two, three, four, and you're like trying to count so that you can get these accurate diagnoses. 
I've had some success in sending patients to a radiologist and specifically saying, please report antral follicle count. They're more likely to, to tell us, but they're not 100%. Um, and I will say that I've had patients who have come to me who've been diagnosed with PCOS five years ago. I'm not necessarily backtracking the diagnosis. You know, like if the diagnosis was made based on 12 before these criteria come out, I'm like leaving it because you don't know what ultrasound uh, was used and sort of what the frequency was used. Even if I diagnosed them a year ago based on 12, I'm not changing it. Um, but it just probably means someone has a milder phenotype. just on every single person that they're doing an ultrasound on, they also quickly report the antral follicle count. Because it's helpful, you don't know if in six months they're going to come back wanting to get pregnant, and it's helpful to know was the antral follicle count only three, or was it 15, regardless of PCOS. So I do have a question now. Uh, so, okay. so first of all, I just want to point out for, for, for the ASR and Greg, I am purely an actor in a supporting role, and then it's all Dr. Cooney. Um, He's working crazy magic in his lab that I understand. <laughs> so the question I have is this. So, you know, if you just sort of PubMed, mm -hmm. depression, and uh, things like uh, immunity, there's just yeah. a lot of um, yeah. studies out there that, that sort of implicate the immune system and depression. Similarly, there's a bunch of like, hypothesis papers out there that, that say, oh, immune system participates in postpartum depression, mm -hmm. right? Um, so with respect to that whole question of yeah. testosterone and CRH hyper or hyper yeah. responsiveness, um, in the larger studies, have you guys ever tried to disentangle testosterone from CRH? And the reason why I ask that is because Testosterone can be associated with sort of that more aggression mm -hmm. and less lower scores with the yeah. depression inventories, whereas insulin resistance mm -hmm. and uh, as a marker of CRH might be uh, more associated with depression. So, do you, do you ever see sort of an inverse mm -hmm. relationship with the, with, between the amount of testosterone uh -huh. and IR? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Um, generally, it's when we think about insulin resistance and testosterone, they seem to go hand in hand. So it's really, when you think about phenotypes, it's the women who have the elevated androgens that are more likely to develop glucose intolerance, diabetes, all of those long-term cardiovascular risks. Yeah, so I think that they're more parallel than like opposite. But there's really been, I think, very few, like that's insulin resistance and testosterone, testosterone which everybody thinks about. Nobody's thinking about, you know, the, the COP, like the, they're not putting that together with the testosterone or with the insulin resistance and definitely not doing it with depression or anxiety. Yeah. And, and also with respect to clinical care, mm -hmm. what about the and sort of... Yeah, so I... Anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't prescribe any of those just because I feel like it's not necessarily in my scope of practice but I very much support people being on it. So when I think about treatment of depression outside of all of these PCOS specific things, at this point I'm just recommending that people get treated the same way you know, their psychologist normally would. And again, reassuring them that, you know, having that sort of risk benefit conversation with pregnancy, but I want someone to be healthy, I want their depression to be treated, so encouraging people to get like appropriate treatment. But yeah, there's there's literally nothing specifically in this population, so we're just based on what happens in the general population. Okay, well join me. Thank you, Dr. Cooney. Thank you.